Okay, continuing on with our fisheries discussion, I next want to talk about one of the most popular responses to overexploitation, which is spatial management. Maybe we can create an area that we cordon off essentially and say no one can do fishing here. You can only fish outside of the area. And, uh, and we'll see how that goes. Again, why are we worried about this? So what'd you catch? Hit the mother load today. You've got to be kidding. Do I even need the gauge? fish this big in years. Okay, it's not this bad. But fishing today simply isn't what it's... Okay. So a little, little, right? So that's what we're trying to prevent, right? We want fish for everybody. We want fish for the fishies. We want fish for, for everyone. A couple key things let's make sure we're all on the same page with. First, most of these critters we're talking about when we talk about managing fisheries, most reef organisms and uh, indeed many, many open ocean critters as well, have so-called bipartite, two-part life history strategies. There's, generally speaking, a more widely ranging, widely dispersive phase that could be as an egg, that could be as a larva. wherein the propagule, the critter, could potentially go a long ways away from mom or dad, widely dispersing. Then, the, the, if the organism survives, if not eaten or filter feeded out of the water column or something like that, um, filter feeded, filter fed out of the water column. Man, gotta, gotta get some better drugs. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you survive, you start to metamorphose, you turn into a juvenile and then an adult, and the adults tend to be relatively sedentary, meaning relatively sight attached. It could be an, extre an extreme example of this would be something like a barnacle, where once that barnacle larval set larvae settles out, it ain't going nowhere, right? He's glued his head to the rock, so he literally is not going to move anywhere else. But even critters that aren't glued to the substrate or anchored in the substrate, they too can, in effect, be, be like they're glued, depending on what spatial scale we're talking about. Okay? So this bipartite life history is absolutely key. It's one of the reasons why it's so hard to manage fisheries compared to perhaps things we're more uh, familiar with. So the classic example would be a deer population in a valley. How many baby deer are we going to have next year? Let's go out this year and count the number of pregnant moms. Let's go count those pregnant moms. And that'll be a pretty good indicator of how many babies we're going to have next year. Because when mom gives birth, those babies are going to stay in that valley. By analogy, what's going on here is it's as if we went and counted the pregnant moms and then the moms like shot their babies up in the atmosphere, right? And they drift around with the winds for a while. So it's a lot harder to estimate the growth rate, the sustainability of that population, the persistence of those critters in that area, et cetera, because of that. So bipartite life history. Some of these critters can, that dispersive phase might be minutes. Some it might be hours. Some it might be weeks. Some it might be years. So it can be, it can be um, uh, you know, important amount of time. So again, we have the sedentary phase and we have the dispersive phase. The other thing to note about um, fisheries 
stuff before we enter into this discussion of, of place-based protection is that fecundity, the amount of offspring you can make, in many cases is tied to the size of the critter, particularly for females, particularly for eggs. So this is an example of this. So we have a fish on the left-hand side that's 14.6 inches, ranging up to one that's 23.6 inches on the right. The number of eggs the fish on the left is going to be able to produce is about 150,000 um, in, in their lifetime. On the right, even though it's, only, it's less than twice the length, right? So it's bigger, definitely, but it's not a million times bigger. But look, it's order of ma orders of magnitude more babies being produced. So, or eggs, we could say. So on the order of 1.7 million. So in other words, what this rockfish illustrates is that there's this nonlinear relationship. So people use the term um, boff, uh, big old fat females, meaning there's a disproportionate effect of some of the larger individuals in the population relative to, to um, you know, all the other little ones floating around. Now, why might that matter? Well, why might that matter? Greater um, survival numbers after the predation. Sure, sure. So the more babies, the more likelihood that you're going to have your population survive. When people are all out trying to get the biggest Right, fish. right. So when we go, when you, people go out spearfishing, do they usually go for the little fish or the big honk? We go for the big honking fish. You can take the little lobster or the big honking lobster, right? I'm going to take the big honking lobster. When I was on a project with my friend that we were looking at um, the sex change of these groupers in Mexico, um, he's a great spear fisherman, and he would like shoot all the big fish, and it was an excuse to go hunt fish because we had to look and see what their sex was and stuff. And then we just had to eat all the fish. But, um, but I would shoot the small golden phase, which were small. And it's funny to say I'm not, like, not, a, I'm not a great spear fisherman, to be totally frank. But also, it was harder. It's harder to shoot something this big, right, a foot big, versus something that's the size of the screen. So that's, that was my excuse. I always said, yeah, you guys are lame, and I, I had the harder shot. I had, always had the harder shots. But the point is, right, we as humans tend to target the biggest of the big. And it's probably best to let the biggest of the big hang out and target some of the more medium-bodied critters in a system like this. I have a question. Uh, I remember at the fish pond, he had mentioned that they usually harvest the ones that are in that medium range. So that way they can, or, was it the, or they, they try to avoid the ones in the medium range or something. I think they try to avoid the biggest of the big so that they keep reproducing, I think. Does anybody else remember what he said? I think that's what he said. Okay. What we're talking about here with protected areas is really a form of a biological reserve. Something we've seen over and over again over the years. The basic assumption with this management approach is that if we protect well-functioning ecosystems we will get healthy, abundant populations, healthy, abundant communities, etc. It's important to realize that this idea emerged, uh, modern idea emerged in the U.S., and it emerged with our sense of wilderness, meaning humans not in the picture, meaning the ultimate is to have nature doing its due with no people in the picture whatsoever. So why do we need marine reserves? Here's a couple quotes. Here's a couple quotes for you. So why, why, why might marine reserves be something of interest? During my, I'll read them to you. During my recent visit to Santa Catalina Island, I was gr deeply impressed with the threatened danger to the commercial and valued sport giving fisheries at the island. This island for three or four miles offshore is the spawning ground for the valuable food fishes of Southern California and particularly of Los Angeles. And that this region should be protected absolutely from all kinds of nets 
or hand lines for commercial or market purposes. So basically saying, hey, the Catalina is a really important place. A lot of people are fishing there. We should, we should make sure that it's, it's adequately protected. Next quote. Fishing around Catalina Island over the previous 30 years decreased stocks to the extent that the supply has dropped off to a menacing extent due to a lack of laws, lack of protection, and overfishing. The angling here in year left blank to year left blank was the most remarkable in the world. But with the coming of power boats, seines, trawls, other nets, the fisheries began to decrease until it was evident that something must be done. The most menacing danger was the alien who attached a gill net to the kelp and ran it out to sea. By alien, this means uh, Mexican immigrant folks. Uh, 50 such nets have been counted in a mile and a half. 50 nets counted in a mile and a half. So what year do you think they're talking about? The angling here, talking about Catalina, the angling here in blank to blank was the most remarkable in the world. What are some guesses you guys have for this? Eighty to eighty-five. What's that? Okay, so we got a, I got a vote for nineteen eighty-five. Got a vote for more recently. So let's say, man, this pen. Okay, so we got nineteen eighty-five. I got more recent. So what do you want to say, nineteen ninety or something like that? Yeah. Okay. What are some other guesses? Nineteen sixty. Oops, 1960. Okay, cool. Any other guesses? 1970s. I'll say 1975. Any other? Any other ones? 1970. Another 1970. Okay. So we got 80. We got basically 70. It's 1960 to 1985 is the range we're talking about. Or excuse me, 1990. 1960 to 1990. The first quote was from 1912. The last quote was from a report that I lifted. So, and I've lifted it to verbatim. That's why they say things that we don't exactly, like we don't spell offshore, off hyphen shore, but that, that's how they spelled it back then. Uh, so 1912 and 1913. So the year that they said everything was awesome was 1886, not 1986. 1886 to 1900 was the most remarkable in the world. But with the coming of power boats, seines, trawls, and other nets, the fisheries began to decrease until it was evident that something must be done. So again, this problem of overexploitation is not a new phenomenon. Even within our relatively short time period of, of well-documented historical records, we see, these, see this having happened, in this case, over a century ago right here. So this, this push, the, 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 this, 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 these series of reports um, led to an establishment of a three nautical mile reserve around Catalina Island that banned all nets, all, all fishing nets. It lasted less than a year, excellent, because the canning industry and the fishermen wanted to keep doing it. So they got it reversed. It took until 1997 where we passed a gill net ban uh, uh, on Catalina Island for, for this to kind of come back. This is what we're talking about. So everybody have a look at this, right? This is what I'm trying to explain to you, how fundamentally different things are now versus then. On the left, is what we used to call um, a black sea bass. Now we call it a giant sea bass, but it's the same thing. This is from, you guys, any guesses as to where this was caught? Catalina Island. This fish on the left was caught at Magoo. So right here, right, 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 just straight to the ocean from campus. The title on this picture that I took from the museum in downtown Ventura was a typical Saturday catch from the Magoo Pier. 
We don't have a pier anymore in Magoo. It was destroyed by a hurricane that came through in the 1920s. The pier would be packed with people fishing, pulling up. Maybe not every single fish was like that, but this was, this was a common occurrence. That is a huge fish, right? Um, I don't think I, the, the amount, the weight was written down, but it, we're talking like, I don't know, 400 pounds, something like that. That's a big fish. That is a top predator. Look at that fish's mouth. That fish's mouth is about the size of that lady's head, right? And if he gaped it way open, it could probably put a couple heads in, right? It could wolf down a bunch of pumpkins off your door stoop right now. Huge predator. Endangered. It's recovering now, which is a success story, but, but we nearly drove this critter to extinction. On the right is a lady with a white sea bass, uh, in that case, more southerly towards San Diego, northern Baja. And on the right is Catalina Island. I took that picture from the, one of the reports I just quoted from. And you can, see, um, you can see all these guys, and they're seining for fish, and out in the water are all these other boats that are doing similarly or getting ready to do similar things. So this is what our systems were, were filled with fish like this back in the day. This is crazy. This is awesome. This thing on the left, eat anything on the reef. It'll, it'd eat lobster. It'd eat smaller fish. It'd eat whatever the heck it could get in its gullet, right? Massive predator. Very different system with it missing. I've only seen one live giant sea bass in the wild myself. It was a juvenile, and I messed my pants when I saw it. It came out of the reef, and I, I thought it was a semi about to mow me down. It was a small, relatively speaking, small individual, probably just maybe like half the size of this table here, and uh, you know, like three feet long, three, four feet long, but it was huge. I could only imagine what one of these full-grown guys would look like out there. He'd probably come want to eat me or something. Okay. Marine protected areas. We normally abbreviate this by just saying MPA, um, but everybody knows what we're talking about. The existing marine protected area networks that we have, historically, up in the last few years, have really been driven more by opportunity than, than really robust design. So the quote I have here from Hackman is that they were driven more by opportunity than design, scenery rather than science, just like our national parks, right? We set those things aside because we thought they were pretty or we thought they were majestic. We weren't really designing national parks to recover uh, you know, elk or something like that typically, right? Uh, the number is constantly changing, but you know we have we have many thousands of reserves in at least eighty countries territorial waters. Here are some of the largest global reserves. In quotes, Pippa, which is the Phoenix Island area, is basically a joke. It doesn't really exist. It's on paper only. More about that later, but at least on paper it says it's about four, uh, 410,000 square kilometers. In reality, it, it means nothing. There's, there's no real park there. Um, we just got back this, week, this morning from visiting um, Hawaii, where one of the things we did was talk about the Northwest Hawaiian um, uh, island protected area, sanctuary. Before this August, the number was 362,000 square kilometers in extent, huge area, huge area. President Obama signed <coughs> an, ex an, an expansion of that out to the limits of our territorial waters. And so as of right now, as of last couple months, it's about 1.5 million square kilometers, a massive area, truly massive area. Um, and then there's the Great Barrier Reef protected areas uh, network. There's the Marianas Trench protected area network, and 
um, the Pacific Remote Islands National Marine uh, Sanctuary, which is sort of these farther away islands. We always hear about these giant, um, and these really are large scale, and they really, we really should be talking about them as something different. They're so massive. How do you manage 150,000 square kilometers, right? You need robots. You need robots and drones. I mean, you, you just can't, there's no way a few people with a modest budget can possibly enforce rules and things like that and do monitoring and stuff there. In the case of California, it's much easier. Our reserves tend to be much smaller on an on, in aerial extent, right? So for example, Elkhorn Slough up in Moss Landing area is about two square kilometers. Carmel Bay is about four square kilometers. Or I did my PhD out of Catalina was, is only 0 0.15 square kilometers, so small. Um, I've not updated my global, global data this calculation in the last couple years, but it, it hasn't changed substantially. So, oops, sorry, you guys can't quite see that. So the, I have the mean size is 44 square kilometers. That's absolutely driven by these huge, large scale marine protected areas. The important thing would be the median here. That'd be a better measure. And the answer there is four square kilometers. So most of these reserves are small. There's a few giant honkers out there that distort the data. Most are small. So there are many reserves scattered across many countries, mostly small in aerial extent. OK, let's talk a little bit about some theory here. <coughs> <clears throat> this is a, a classic figure from a report uh, some of our friends did a few years ago. And what we're showing here is, uh, so marine protected areas have become a very popular tool to manage fish populations. However, until very recently, we haven't had a huge amount of evidence that these tools really work. So this is one of the first sort of wide-ranging arguments people put together. These guys did a, a meta-analysis, read a bunch of different papers, looked at a bunch of different studies, and wanted to ask the question, if we put in a marine protected area, if we put in a closure where people cannot fish, do we see more things in that area over time? And so that's what's being illustrated here with different measures. One is biomass. One is number of individuals per unit area or per unit volume. Next is uh, how big the critters are and then biological diversity and basically this means species richness in this in this particular graph. The average is represented by the bars and then all the individual studies are plotted with the little black dots so that'll to the highest black dot to the lowest black dot gives you the range. And what we see is, after we put, and this is from 124 different reserves around the world, diversity doesn't respond as well as other things, but on average, it increased 21%. Similar for size, um, uh, increased 28% on average. But when we start talking about density and biomass, that's where we see the, at least the short-term difference. Those things respond the quickest. So this suggests that, yes, and, and importantly, important to know that this, this is a break in the scale here. So um, it's not a linear scale on the left. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it'll depend on the study. You have to, you have to, they should say in the study. Well, in, in like marine protected areas. So, yeah, right. But so it's usually a number of fish per square meter. So fish specifically and biomass is just everything? No, they should say. It should be fish biomass or grouper biomass. They should, they should stipulate. It could be 
in this case, this this would be I'm I'm pretty sure this is fish biomass, but I'm not I don't remember. Okay, I'm just thinking like the difference between biomass and density. Okay, so so, so Corey's question is, what's the difference between biomass and density? So biomass, we could have one. Imagine this: we have a starving village, right? Um, and we started giving them food. What's the first thing that's going to happen? Everybody's going to plump up, right? So, the, so their density might not change. They might all stay in that in that village. So the number of people won't be different this month versus last month. Last month, but they might be might weigh more. So we, if we put them on the scale, we'd see that their biomass would be going up. And then maybe over time, maybe if they're healthy enough, maybe they would start having kids again. And so then we'd see there'd be maybe additional people added to the village, right? And then over a long period of time, if they're able to grow, they're not just getting, you know, fatter, they're not just adding on fat, but they're actually starting to grow more healthily, get taller. So that would be the size thing. And then diversity would be if once we have like a really healthy happening village, if we had folks come from all different communities to do stuff. That's the analogy. Does that make sense? Or no? What? What does it make sense? I, I, I guess I just feel like when you describe density, it would fall under biomass. Inside. No, density is a number of discrete individuals. Okay. So you could have a baby or you could have a whale. And they would both be one individual. Oh, okay. But the biomass is different, right? Cool. Other questions? Okay. Um, so, again, the question is, uh, do MPAs make more fish? Are they efficient at making, making more fish? And so here's a, some evidence, indirect, perhaps. And, again, most of these, recall that most of these MPAs are driven by opportunity. They weren't necessarily set up back in the day as a rigorous you know, test, <coughs> be tested by hypothesis to see do MPAs work or not. So therefore, um, we've had a hard time, at least initially, in testing the efficacy of these things. So here's a classic example. Here's one of the oldest uh, reserves we've had in our region of the world. This is um, one out in Scorpion, out on um, uh, Anacapa Island. And this was established <clears throat> in the 70s. And so what we see here, well, so, and so we, we put this reserve into place because it seemed to be a good place for fish and it was really kelpy and all this and that. First thing to note is this is what happens, right? When we have the fished areas, we have not that many lobster. Lobster will eat urchins is one of their things. And so we don't have, much, don't have many lobsters, so we have a lot of urchins, and we have not that much kelp. In the reserve, we have many more lobsters, which keep, help keep down the population of urchins, which allow there to be more kelp, more biomass, etc. Right? Note, however, that it's, it's not, a, not an all or the other kind of thing. There are some years that it's just good for, okay, and so this is a measure of how much kelp we have, right? So kelp, more, uh, less kelp, less kelp, less kelp, more urchins. Some years, like 83, was just good for whoever, wherever you were. It was a relatively good year for kelp. And then other years, again, no matter where you were, like 84, it wasn't as good a year as the previous year. So important to realize there's always this temporal variation in these natural systems. But let's check it out. Even with all of this, even with this natural fluctuation and variation, the marine reserve always had more kelp <coughs> than the fished area. Does that make sense? Any problems with that? Any problems with this, this evidence I might have just given you? Or I might have, I, 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 that I did just give you? It creates an imbalance in the system? 
No. How many reserves am I showing you here? One. One. This was created in the 70s. Did they just put the reserve in some crappy old random place? Put the reserve on the best spot. So it might not be a fair test if, if, the, if our question is, how does the best spot fare to other spots? Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with our reserve. Maybe just that place always historically is, no matter what we did, would be better, right? So to test this, we need a network of plates. So th this, is, this is, you know, supporting our notion, but it's not, it's not a strong test. Everybody with me? So these are some of the things we would think about if we were going about building a marine protected area network. We'd want to think about where we put the, the, the area, the closure, so the location. We'd want to think about how big should that, that area be. How much distance in between these different units that we put in there. And how might we go about making sure everybody understands the rules and obeys by the rules? The criteria we could use for location would be something like, maybe we want to make sure we get all of our ecosystems represented. Maybe we want to make sure that we have at least some sandy bottom, at least some rocky, rocky communities, etc. Some deeper areas, some shallower areas, that kind of stuff. So representation. For size, one of the key things we're going to we want to look at is how do um, critters move? How far do they disperse? How do they, how do they move around? For spacing, we want to look at how much do the dispersive phases move around. So how far do the eggs move around? How far do the larvae move around? And then for enforcement, we want to say, you know, how e easy is it for us to clearly define this? Ecologically, maybe we'd say we'd go halfway from the point to here. But maybe for enforcement, it's better to go from that point to that other point because it's really obvious. Nobody needs a GPS. Everybody can see where it is. And, uh, and do we have any money to spend on enforcement? And so uh, I should have also said earlier, I think I did not, um, that when we're talking about MPA for the purposes of our discussion here, we're just we're going to talk about a, a complete closure, okay? So one that is nobody can fish at all. There are various flavors of marine protected areas. Some can be, uh, you know, partial closures, meaning only certain recreational people can fish, but commercial people can't. For ease, we're going to leave off those those partial, and we're just going to talk about so-called no take reserves, meaning. Nobody can take anything except for maybe a scientist that's monitoring the, the fish populations. Okay, so here are a few questions. We're going to get to some of these and then we're going to call it for the day. Because I can tell you guys are burnt out and my voice is not doing too well. So here are some, some current cutting edge questions that people uh, ask themselves. You might have heard some of these at the Island Symposium a few weeks ago. Number one, are percent protection targets useful in marine environments? Meaning saying, hey, we want 10% of the ocean or 20% of the ocean or 50% of the ocean to be protected. Are those useful? And if so, what, what would, would a good percentage protection target be? Next, how big should any one single reserve in a network be? Is there, is there you know, what's, what's, the, what's the best way to determine size? Key question, do marine protected areas increase fisheries yield outside of the reserve? 
outside of the reserve. It's pretty clear that we can make bigger fish, more fish inside the reserve, but do we get that outside the reserve? And then can we use an existing network as a bit, can we use the existing random haphazard array of reserves of MPAs um, as, as a good starting point or should we just be starting over from scratch? So we might ask, how do we answer these questions? We could do it empirically. We could actually go out and measure things, which is the best. Or we could talk to some mathematicians and do some mathematical models. Both approaches have their value. Both have their uh, downsides. So if we have, so if we want empirical data, we could just simply go to the areas where we do have MPAs right now, and we can just count these guys and say count how many fish are inside, how many fish are outside. The problem is that we have relatively few manipulative experiments that we actually set up to avoid that problem I just mentioned, which was we put the reserve in the best possible space. We have very few tests where we put it in, in sort of mediocre space and with paired with another mediocre space, etc. Therefore, we rely quite a lot on models with this, with this question, with this management question, more so than some of our other management questions. Because, because of just the difficulty and the lack of empirical data. The, the difficulty of doing rigorous tests with existing networks and the lack of empirical data. So models allow us to ask what if questions. Well, what if we doubled the size of the fishing effort or whatever? The problem is models are only as good as their assumptions and the data we put into them. And a lot of times we use pretty poor data when we, when we add stuff to our models, so that's a problem. Also, models are usually very conservative. Okay, let's talk a little bit about percent protection targets. So this uh, got going uh, about 20 years ago. Very appealing, very appealing to the non-technical crowd. Because it's very straightforward, very easy to answer, very easy to understand. So in 1992, the IUCN suggested that na all nations should protect at least 10% of their ecosystems, whether they're on land, underwater, whatever. And that kind of helped get the ball rolling. In the 1990s, uh, this uh, uh, fisheries biologist in Florida started monitoring, of all places, Cape Canaveral. What's Cape Canaveral? Right, where we launch rockets and stuff. Because we rock, launch rockets from there, there they, there's um, exclusion zones where you're not allowed to go. The exclusion zones you're not, not allowed to go, some of them when they're doing a rocket firing, others you're just not ever allowed to go. It's considered part of the base. And Cape Canaveral is kind of a big area. So people, so we started noticing that the, all the, a lot of the state record catches were coming from waters near Cape Canaveral. So he went up and eventually got permission to go start monitoring the fish inside Cape Canaveral and outside. And sure enough, he found they were, there were more fish, more bigger fish, all this and that. So we started getting interested in the spatial protection of critters. And so um, he was trying to figure out what to do. And he was trying to make it understandable to non-technical politicians that had all these other things on their plate. So he was saying, let's put some of our state waters in Florida in, in, in a marine protected area. And the question would be, okay, Mr. Expert, how much should we do? And he didn't, wasn't sure. So we started with that 10% number from the IUCN. So 10%, they started thinking about it. Because again, didn't have much data back then. So he said, well, you know, I don't know, 10%, that seems too small. Mm, 
Maybe 50%. No, 50%, that sounds like too much, right? I don't think people buy into that. And at the time, which is the late 90s, said, we also need to give these guys time to get this together, right? So he hit on this idea of 20%. Why? Because he picked a number. 2020, that's easy to remember. The year 2020. Okay? And 20% is also in 20. So literally, that's how we got this 20% protection target. Again, no data to back it up. So didn't know what, what is the right or wrong answer. So this is a, given that, this is as, as good an answer as anybody had at the time, right? So sometimes when we talk about management, sometimes that's what you need to do. A lot of times we don't have perfect data. We don't have all the, <coughs> excuse me, we don't have all the answers. And we're not gonna anytime soon. But if we see that the need, there's a need for a management action, we sometimes just need to kind of, you know, boom, make, make the call, right? The difference between managers and quote unquote pure scientists, that scientists can wait 30 years to get the answer right. Managers have to make the call right now, even with imperfect data. So this 20% by 2020 thing is, is basically endorsed by the American Academy of Sciences, and then it starts to build steam. One of the World's Park Congress meetings um, a few years later, they suggested um, somewhere between 20 to 30% of all a country's territorial waters should be in some form of no-take. Here's what the modeling results showed um, in the midst of all this stuff. So, so this just spurred a bunch of people to do modeling work in the late 90s, early 2000s. Again, because we didn't have much empirical data then. And so this is, this is the range that we got. So uh, anywhere, so once the, these are just a list of different studies. One of them, five to 50% is what you would need. Um, a red sea urchin, uh, Lou Botsford and his group up at Davis estimated that we need about 15% of California to, to have recovery of this overfished species. Um, and it goes on and on. 15 to 19%, 20%, 30%, 35%, 40%. Um, and some of our heavily uh, uh, <coughs> fished area, such as Channel Islands, you guys read this paper already. They're suggesting maybe upwards of 50% of the Channel Islands should be in some form of no-take. And then of some of the worst of the worst reefs in the whole world are in the Caribbean, massively overfished. Something like 70 to 80% of those waters need to be in a no-take uh, reserve. On average, <clears throat> something like about a third is what the models suggest uh, should be in some form of no take preserve, no take uh, reserve. Many folks have looked at that and said, "Hey, you know, these models might be a little too conservative, so you could probably be you could probably come down a little bit." So most so that led um, several folks to suggest that something like twenty to thirty percent is probably a probably a, a good amount. One thing that becomes clear from the modeling results, the more tweaked the population, the more space they're going to need. So the more heavily exploited or the more overfished a fish stock, we're going to need a greater proportion of the marine area to be in a form of no fishing. If it's well managed, we don't need, you know, maybe any area to be and all told, in North American waters, less, uh, it's, it's, it's close now to about 1%, but it's, it's but a fraction. We are but a fraction of that overall goal. Okay, maybe we'll talk a little bit about how big a reserve should be, and then we'll, we'll put it on pause and pick the rest of this up on uh, our next meeting. So next question is, how big should a reserve be? Um, and that's really going to depend <coughs> Sorry, man. 
<clears throat> it's going to depend on our objective. So notice I haven't told you guys yet about what the <clears throat> motivation for the marine reserves are. <clears throat> We've, I've mentioned fisheries. But it's important to say there are two groups that want marine protected areas in general. People that want more fish and people that want more diversity. These aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, but they, tend to, they do tend to fall out in the different camps. People that want more, want to use these, this tool to maximize biodiversity are really coming at it with a different motivation than the people that want, uh, on average, than the people that are coming about it to boost fishery production. If you want biodiversity, you're generally going to want large reserves, right? So if, if, you, if we have enough money to patrol 100 square kilometers, you're going to maybe want it all in one big, or maybe you know, two, two big ones, two big 50 square kilometers, something like that. If you're someone that really wants there to be more direct impact on the fishery production, you're not, generally speaking, no, all things being equal, you're not going to want one big giant reserve. You're going to want 10 smaller reserves scattered around. So this is what I mean. So this is illustrated with a couple of our reserves now. So if you want to maximize biodiversity, you want a big, huge honking reserve because all the babies that are produced are going to stay inside. Well, it's more likely the babies will stay inside, right? Big area. You can call that larval entrainment because the area is so big, the, the propagules that are produced from there stay in that same area. In contrast, we could have spillover. Spillover is when the, the dispersal, the movement of the fish is bigger than the boundary area. When they're inside the boundary area, fishermen can't fish them. When they're outside the boundary area, fishermen can fish them. Making sense, you guys? So we have biodiversity motivation and we have uh, fishery production motivation. And they tend to push us in different directions when we're trying to design these reserves. Then the question is, so that, that's like theoretical. Now, exactly. Okay, got, got that got that concept. But now we want to know, you, Mr. Fisheries Manager, exactly how big should it be. Well, we have some tagged fish data here. I'll show you some more in a second. And so, check it out. This is the max, this is where we tag a fish and then detect it elsewhere and, and measure how far those places are. So we have the snapper up here down to the snook. <coughs> <laughs> from different places around the world. Some of these, these are all fish, obviously. So this guy, and this is a logarithmic scale on the bottom here in miles. So this guy is moving, you know, less than a mile from where he was tagged. Versus this guy is moving something like, I don't know, 200, 300 miles, right? So if we wanted to design a reserve, let's say, to entrain that fish population, we could probably do a pretty good one with this one if we had, like, say, a one, you know, a, a reserve that was one mile by one mile, or if we made it two miles by two miles, pretty good chance that we're going to get those fish retained in our area. This guy, not even close, man. This guy's going hundreds of miles. So a one or two square kilometer thing ain't going to do it, right? So we can look at that actual direct tagging of those guys and how they moved. We can also look at population genetics to see how similar populations are. And th from that, we can get an estimate of how far the dispersal of these organisms occurs. So in this case, seaweeds tend to disperse relatively close. Again, logarithmic scale here. But this is in miles. So most of the propagate, most of the species of seaweeds in this review study were falling out, you know, they moved less than a mile. Invertebrates are all over the place. Invertebrates are also less than a mile to more than, you know, hundreds of miles away. 
fish as a group tend to be much wider dispersing critters. Right? So if we want to design a reserve for fish, that might have a different design constraint than a reserve <clears throat> to recover overexploited seaweed, let's say. <clears throat> As I said before, reserve effects are going to depend on, on the size. And um, Ben Halpern suggested in a review he did about a decade or so ago that um, we really need reserves on the order of, a lot of this was about us here in California, on the order of 10 to 20 square kilometers for a site attached species. And for really wide ranging species, it's uh, or highly migratory species, it's just totally unknown. Uh, the, this group from Davis uh, suggested that we should make them as large as practically possible. So, uh, in other words, the bigger we can make it, the better the bang we'll get. If our goal is conservation, if our goal is to just boost fisheries, we should have them as small as possible and as as all over the place as possible. And then crew from Santa Barbara, Steve Gaines and his students, uh, suggested that um, if we have pretty strong currents like we have along the California coast, um, multiple reserves tend to be better than a single one large one um, and would tend to produce more uh, babies. Another line of evidence we can look at is movement of fish. So... Uh, this is um, how far these fishes are migrating. And it turns out 85% of the fish of these 26 reef species for, so this would be stuff here in the Channel Islands, 85% move less than three kilometers. So they're pretty sight attached. The difference would be the deeper dwelling things, things way down deep, the deep dwelling rock fishes um, and the like seem to move uh, quite a bit. So this obviously gets to this notion of connectivity. So here's a cartoon. This is from uh, our friend Ryan over at NOAA now. So he kindly lent me these couple slides from his talk uh, the other week at the Island Symposium. So this is, this is an, an, illust an animation of low connectivity. So if our islands are doing their deal and nobody's really mixing, let's say, with the mainland, this is what we'd see. See fish doing that, right? So there's a, every once in a while there's something that moves, but for the most part, the guys around Santa Rosa stay around Santa Rosa, the guys on the mainland stay on the mainland, etc. If we had high connectivity, it would look like this, right? They would all go, the island guys go to the mainland, mainland would go to the island, Santa Cruz would go to Santa Rosa, and vice versa. So it just so happens that uh, his group and his consortium have been doing this. So they have a bunch of acoustic tags and they have a bunch of acoustic listening stations. And they have them, they're they trying to get them throughout, this, throughout Southern California, but we'll just focus on our, our Channel Islands area here for, for this. <clears throat> so the pink are the, is our most recent marine reserve network or MPA network in the Channel Islands you guys have read about. And the yellow are acoustic listening stations. So these are tags that are constantly beep 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 and at a certain frequency and so you can tell uh, who they are and by triangulation you can tell where they are so from this data from tagging a bunch of various fish what these guys have found is that we have a lot of large sharks that are moving into our waters on, in the channel islands seasonally they appear to be tracking the recovered uh, Elephant seals, sea lion populations, pinniped populations. So they're coming down to eat, which is cool. Um, but they're also seeing movement, not just of these big honking sharks, but of smaller bodied sharks. So they're seeing critters move off of, you know, San Diego and Northern Baja up to the Channel Islands, vice versa, etc. So here's, here's evidence of uh, these different fish that are recorded in their acoustic tags around the Channel Islands. And what you see is, you see clear seasonality. 
So in the case of white sharks, if we had a reserve where they weren't allowed to be fished, they would be protected for some of the time. But, they're, but the adult sharks are going off to the middle of the Pacific, right? So if we're trying to protect them their entirety of their lives, there's no way we can make a marine protected area big enough to recover those uh, white sharks, right? So the MPAs might not be an effective tool to manage white shark populations. So here's, I'll just flip through a couple slides and then maybe call it there for today. So um, here's some other evidence of uh, critters where they were detected on an array. The circle is green. Where we've not detected them, it is red. So bat rays around Santa Rosa seem fairly uh, stationary, right? There's not a lot of evidence of moving between them. White sharks, we're catching those guys on um, virtually all of our detects. The ones on the mainland, the ones on the island, etc. Interesting, there is some movement. And what we tend to see is we tend to see a segregation in terms of the size classes. So even though there's white sharks all around here, the babies and the older ones aren't mixing. So again, if we wanted to produce, uh, so these guys are wide ranging. So this is telling us that if we wanted to produce a reserve that protected white sharks, it'd have to be really big because the, the babies and the adults aren't, aren't uh, sympatric. Um, giant sea bass, we see them, but they're not moving tremendously. These superfin sharks are all over the place, right? So they're one that, ones that are moving apparently quite a lot. And yeah, I should have skipped the yellowtail. Okay, so just to finish up this question, so how big should a marine reserve be? Um, generally speaking, if we're in near shore or shallow water, small reserves might be okay. A single reserve might be okay because it's going to be more likely to encompass a bunch of different communities. You guys with me on this? If we're close into shore, we have one, let's say, one square kilometer area. It's a pretty good chance we're going to get some intertidal, some sandy bottom, you know, some kelp forest, that kind of stuff. Versus if we go far off deeper waters, that same unit area is going to tend to be more homogeneous. So the offshore and deeper areas, we tend to need fewer reserves than in the shallower waters. But the area of each um, is going to need to go up because, again, those offshore areas tend to be more homogeneous. We, we, we miss out on getting all the different parts of the community. An idea people have talked about in recent years, this notion of actually creating temporary. And I've seen this come up now increasingly in different talks where people say, hey, the fishermen are using fishing technology to track the productivity fronts that are popping up and winking off across the Pacific. Maybe we should have reserves that track with those moving water masses. So that would be something like a reserve around a, around a pelagic gyre. <sighs> so this would be something that would vary in time and space based on the varying realities of productivity, etc. This is a, an example of, a, of an MPA that could only be in existence in the modern era with all our satellite technology and everything. It's still unclear that we'd ever achieve this, but and, and the enforcement would be a nightmare because a lot of these are on the open ocean. But... Uh, but that's some guidance on how big a reserve should be, at least. <clears throat>